Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get Dad for Father's Day? Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1 and save 15% off your order when you check out Row 1 Brand's Vintage Sports Pictorium Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for Dad this Father's Day. If he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 Vintage NFL Helmet Poster. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1. In college, at Little McNeese State, Tom Sestak was a tight end. But in the pros, his coach, Lou Saban, saw something different and converted him to defensive tackle. It was a smart move because Tom Sestak not only became one of the best in the AFL, many thought he became the best defensive tackle in all of football. Period. Next. On Sports Forgotten Heroes, I'm going to talk about the wonderful but short career of one of football's most overlooked superstars, Tom Sestak. This is Sports Forgotten Heroes, a tribute to the stars who shape the games we love to watch and the games we love to play. Stars who provided us with many thrills, but when their time was up, they faded away. We'll take a look back at their spectacular careers, their moments of fame, even if it was just for one season or just one game. And now, here's your host, Warren Rogan. Hello and welcome to episode number 85 of Sports Forgotten Heroes. Hope everyone is hanging in there and feeling well and staying safe. What a crazy time we're experiencing. But... As I record this episode, things are getting back to normal, at least a little bit when it comes to sports. Baseball just had its opening day. The MLS is playing its tournament. The NBA gets back to its season later this week and the NHL a few days later. The NFL, well, training camps are opening. So the world of sports is coming back into full swing and never before have all four major sports been in full action like we're going to be experiencing over the coming weeks. As usual, during the summer months on Sports Forgotten Heroes, I talk a lot about baseball's forgotten stars. And of course, when football enters the picture, I like to interject a few forgotten stars from the gridiron as well. So with training camps due to open this week, I thought it'd be a great time to talk a little football. And on this episode of Sports Forgotten Heroes, I'm going to focus on a forgotten star from the Buffalo Bills, Tom Sestak. He's a really interesting subject to talk about for sure. Tom played college ball at McNeese State University in Louisiana. For the Cowboys, he played tight end. But Sestak was a big dude, 6'4", 270 pounds. He was taken by the Detroit Lions in the 16th round of the NFL draft. But at the time, there was a second football draft, the AFL, and the Buffalo Bills selected him in the 17th round. It was tough getting recognized at a place like McNeese State, so pro football teams really didn't know much about players from the smaller schools. Nonetheless, word filtered through both leagues that Sestak was definitely a guy that should be looked at. Tom decided to sign with Buffalo instead of Detroit because he felt he would have a better chance of making the roster of a newer team as opposed to an established team like the Lions. Plus, the Bills weren't very good and that would help his chances of making the team too. You know, at that time, the Bills were putting together a pretty good team, and their coach, Lou Saban, was building a defense that would stifle opposing offenses in what was a high-flying offensive time in the AFL. But he was missing one key ingredient, a big, athletic defensive lineman who could wreak havoc. Enter 
Sestak. Saban liked what he was and quickly converted Sestak from a tight end to a defensive tackle. And the move, well, it paid immediate dividends. With Sestak in the lineup, the Bills proceeded to put together their first winning season, going 7-6-1 in 1962. And for the next six years, the Bills were one of the AFL's best, winning two AFL championships. My guest today to talk about Tom Sestak is Greg Tranter. A few years ago, Greg wrote a terrific biography about Tom for the Professional Football Researchers Association, and he has a wealth of knowledge when it comes to talking about Sestak and the Bills. I'm sure you're going to enjoy our conversation. Before we get there, however, just a few reminders, please. Follow Sports Forgotten Heroes on Twitter, at Sports F Heroes. Here, I make daily posts about the stars I talk about. Check out the Sports Forgotten Heroes page on Facebook, follow on Instagram, or visit Sports Forgotten Heroes on the web, sportsfh.com. That's sportsfh.com. Here, I have more information on the forgotten stars I talk about, the guests I interview, and it's a great way to contact me with questions, suggestions, and comments. Again, that's sportsfh.com. Hey, if you listen on Apple Podcasts, please give me a five-star rating. As always, thanks for your support. Now, let's get to today's show about Tom Sestak with my guest, Greg Tramp. Greg, thanks for joining me on Sports Forgotten Heroes. So glad you could be here. Oh, thanks. I appreciate it. I'm uh, excited to, uh, to join and talk to you about uh, what we're going to talk about. Awesome. So Tom Sestak, let's start it this way. Who was he and how did his playing in the AFL instead of the NFL affect his notoriety? So, yeah, so Tom Sestak was a 17th round draft choice of the Bills, Buffalo Bills, and actually a 16th round draft choice of the Detroit Lions. But he decided to go with the Bills because of the startup league. He thought he'd have a better chance to play. Mm. Um, Sestak, he was a tight end at McNeese state in college. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when he joined the bills, their, uh, coaching staff switched him to, de- to defensive tackle. Mm-hmm. Um, now this guy, he's, you know, six foot five, 270 pounds. So he was, you know, that's, that was big for a defensive tackle, at least back in 1962. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Sestak just, he was really probably considered the best defensive tackle in the American football league during the 10 years of the, of the AFL. Um, and the, the bills were a little bit different team than the rest of the AFL. Most of the AFL was known for being a wide open offensive passing league. And the bills were more of a defensive team first. Mm -hmm. Um, and of course they had Sestak who really led that, but they had a tremendous, uh, front four, uh, Ron McDowell was was part of that front four. Mm-hmm. Jim Dunaway, um, uh, they had a very strong front four, and they had a strong set of of linebackers. Um, and so, in his rookie year, nineteen sixty three, he started playing defensive tackle for the first time in his career, um, and was rookie of the year mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. in his in his first year with the Bills. And it just happened to be that when he joined them, and it wasn't just because of him, they also started to get good. Um, so in his second year in 1963, uh, the Bills made um, made the playoffs for the first time. They tied with the Boston Patriots in the Eastern Division, and, uh, and then they they lost in the playoff game. But it was the first time they'd had a winning record, and the first time that you know they were really competitive. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and then and then in '64 they won the AFL uh, championship, and really they won it defensively. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean they their defense in 1964. And again, if you think back to those days where the league was primarily a running league, they, they allowed 65 yards a game rushing. Yeah, it's crazy. In 1964. <laughs> um, let, let me know, ask, and a lot of yeah, that was Sestak. Yeah, let me ask you this. So he played at a really small school, McNeese State. And like you said, he was a tight end and 
was converted to a defensive tackle. So a couple of questions there. McNeese State, he's a tight end. Why is a six foot five guy that weighs two hundred and what'd you say, seventy nine pounds? Two hundred and seventy pounds. Two hundred and seventy yeah. pounds. How is he a tight end at McNeese State and not a defensive lineman? Well, I think um, my guess is he was probably a tight end because they were a power running team. And so here you got a, you know, six foot five, 275 pound guy who can block. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I suspect that, you know, he didn't catch a lot of passes. (laughs) So (laughs) I, um, you know, because again, if you go back to those, back in those days in college, most of those, many of the schools were, were, you know, running teams where they'd only throw the ball eight, 10 times a game and run most of the time. Mm-hmm. And so you put your biggest, strongest guys on the offensive line and your tight end was really another offensive lineman. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, also, like you said, he wasn't a high draft pick by either league. Like You know, the Lions selected Tom in the 16th round of the NFL draft. The Bills selected Tom in the 17th round of the AFL draft. So you said that he elected to go to the Bills because he had a better shot to play. But the question is this. How much did – it's funny. He, he, he makes choices – at this young age that possibly affect his notoriety in two different ways. Um, As I, as I had asked earlier, how much did playing in the AFL affect his notoriety? Well, how much did playing for McNeese state affect his notoriety as far as his evaluation to be even drafted by one of the leagues? Yeah, I mean, it is. To, I mean, you, you could you could easily argue it's interesting that he was even drafted because yeah, you think yeah. again, you think back in those days, they didn't have scouts all over the country, you know, turning over every football player that was playing. Um, most of it in those days was a coach would talk to another coach, um, and so mm-hmm. there's usually some connection of hey. You know, somebody probably called one of the Bills coaches and said, hey, you should take a look at this guy and draft him. He's he's got some talent. Um, and, you know, in the 17th round, I mean, it's like you're taking a flyer on the guy. And I think that was the the uniqueness of Lou Saban, who was the Bills coach at the time, is he was really good at moving players to different positions mm-hmm. and finding the best position. I mean, another another example of that is George Sames was a was a halfback in college at Michigan state, he comes to the bills and they put him in at safety and he becomes one of the best safeties in the mm-hmm. American football league. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so Saban was known for moving players to different positions and and then they all of a sudden becoming, you know, superstars at, 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 at that new position. And, and obviously Sestak is, you know, probably the greatest example of, of that. Um, because he, even, even though the AFL lacked notoriety, he was really regarded in probably 63, 64, and 65 as the best defensive tackle in all of football. Right. So what did, so what did Lou Saban see in him that said, this guy is not a tight end. He's, he is a defensive tackle. Is it strictly sized? What, what did he see that says, you know what, this is, this guy's a defensive tackle. And perhaps, I mean, it's all speculation or guessing, but I wonder what the Lions would have done at that point. Right. You know, they, they may have tried him at tight end and he basically plays one season and then he's probably out of the league. Right. Um, but, yeah. I, but yeah. you know, what, what, what Saban said about him um, is he, he really talked about his strength, his interior pass rush, which, of course, he wouldn't have known being a tight end. But I think some of it was his smarts. Mm-hmm. He he was very smart at, at the ability to read the offensive keys and the instincts. Um, and I suspect, you know, Saban thought, here's a guy who played offense. Jeez, if I put him in defense, maybe he'll have, have instincts about offense. And he did mm-hmm. um, because he was a tremendous interior pass rusher. Mm-hmm. I mean, for a defensive tackle in 1964, he averaged nine tackles a game. I mean, for a defensive tackle, yeah. that's almost yeah. unheard of. Yeah. Um. Well, you know, well, so 
I suspect that's what he saw, some smarts in him and, you know, some instincts. Mm -hmm. Now, like you said, in, in his rookie year, he was named Rookie of the Year, and he played a key role in lifting the Bills to their first ever winning season. They went 7-6-1. and one. What else can you tell us about his rookie year and how he developed into this incredible defensive lineman and why he was able to make such an immediate impact? Well, I think that, um, you know, he, he, he started right from the opening from the opening game. So clearly Saban saw something in training camp. And of course, back again, back in those days, they, their training camps were both lengthy. And they also played. I mean, it wasn't like today. I mean, in the preseason games, the starters played most of the games. Mm. Um, and so clearly he he made a name for himself in the in the preseason. Um, and then I think as he got into the to the regular season games, it because he he did, he averaged seven tackles a game um in his rookie season. So I mean, clearly he was making plays in every game that that stood out, and he just continued, I think, to get better as he learned the position. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what about the bills? They, you know, until he got there, they just, they just weren't a good team. Now, granted it was only, you know, a couple of years, but um, well, tell us a little bit about the bills and their early history, if you can. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, uh, you know, in 19, you know, R Ralph Wilson um, founded the team in 1959 um, he, he actually wasn't going to put a team in Buffalo. He wanted to put a team in Miami. Mm -hmm. um, that was his first choice. Uh, but he couldn't uh, he couldn't get use of the Orange Bowl. The uh, the city of Miami wouldn't let him use the Orange Bowl because it was used for college football mm -hmm. back then. Mm -hmm. um, and so he ended up being convinced by a friend who knew of the Buffalo Bills back in the All-American Football Conference in the late 40s. And that team drew very well. Um, and so there was a friend of his from Buffalo who basically called them and said, y you should put a team in Buffalo. They have a great fan base. Mm -hmm. um, and so he did. He paid his twenty five thousand dollars <laughs> to join the American Football League. Um, and then he um, he hired Buster Ramsey, who was the defensive uh, coordinator for the Lions. And actually, in the Bills first two years of 1960 and 61, they wore the same colors as the Lions because hmm. Wilson was a part owner. He was a 5% oh, owner of the okay. Lions. Okay, I didn't know that. So he brought the blue and silver of the Lions. He brought Buster Ramsey. Um, and so their first two years, they, you know, they were a little bit less than 500. They were like 5, 8, and 1, 6, and 8. Mm -hmm. um, and then he fired Ramsey and hired Lou Saban. Um, and then it was the drafts of like 62 and 63 that they really fortified the talent on the team. You know, that's when they drafted Sestak, they drafted Billy Shaw, they drafted Stu Barber, mm -hmm. um, Al B. Miller, um, you know, several of the players that were, um, you know, part of their championship teams. And then they got lucky um, by picking up Jack Kemp on waivers from from the Chargers. Mm -hmm. um, Sid Gilman mm -hmm. put him on waivers, thoughting, thinking that he could recall him, and he couldn't. And so the Bills selected him, and Kemp came to to Buffalo, and you know ultimately led them, you know, from yeah. a quarterback's point of view to the two championships. And then the other thing that Saban was really good at was he went after some Canadian Football League players. That's how he got Cookie Gilchrist. Mm -hmm. um, that's how he got Ernie Warlick, who was a you know their starting tight end. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it was a combination of, you know, picking up Canadian football league players, really being adept at drafting. And then of course, getting, getting Kemp, mm -hmm. um, which really pulled the team together. And then, you know, S Saban was a run first coach. I mean, he had cookie Gilchrist, of course, later in his career, he comes back to the bills and has OJ Simpson and, sure. makes, you know, OJ Simpson, a great, you know, professional runner, um, mm -hmm. at that time. Cause most people thought that he was going to be a bust. Mm -hmm. until mm -hmm. until Saban took over. Mm -hmm. um, it was actually a pretty smart move by Wilson to not go to Miami and go to Buffalo. I mean, after all, in the old uh, AAFC, there was a team named the Miami Seahawks, and 
they couldn't draw at all. So probably a, a better move, no matter how you slice it, that he ended up in Buffalo. Now, you had also mentioned those early Buffalo te- uh, those early Bills teams um, and, and some of those early stars and the way they were able to put that defense together. You said Ron McDowell and Jim Dunaway, and Tom Day. I mean, how tough, and now you add Sestak to it, just how tough was that defense? Well, I mean, what's what's probably the most amazing statistic that tells you about the defense is for 17 consecutive games, <laughs> they did not allow a rushing touchdown. Yeah, that's, 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 still that's the NFL crazy. Record. That's crazy. And, and, and again, you know, in, in today's pass happy league, you sit there and go, OK, well, maybe that's possible. Back then, most of the touchdowns were scored running the football. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and to go 17 consecutive games between, you know, halfway through the 64 season to halfway through the 65 season without allowing a rushing touchdown is is really in, incredible. Yeah. Um, and that just shows you how strong that defense was. And then, as I said earlier, you know, in in 64, they allowed 65 yards rushing average per game and then the other thing that a lot of people don't give the bills the credit for that they deserve is the two championship games where they played the chargers Mm -hmm. especially in 65 they played the chargers in san diego yeah San, san diego had the number one rated offense in the league the number one rated defense in the league and the bills beat them 23 to nothing and earlier in the season they had lost to san diego 34 to 3 that's right. Um, and, you know, a lot of people, and of course, this was a San Diego team that in 63, they won the AFL championship over the Patriots 51 to 10. Wow. Um, which, in, which until the Bills beat the, uh, the LA Raiders in the 1990 AFC championship game, it was the largest championship victory in, you know, AFL slash AFC history. Hmm. Interesting. The 51 to yeah. 10. Yeah. Um, and then the next two years, they played the Bills in 64. They get one touchdown. 65, they get none. They yeah, shut tw- out. 20, 20 to 7 that first time around. You know what You know what I find really interesting is that t- even today, the, the Chargers are still this high-flying passing team. I mean, it's always been their identity. Um, <laughs> and, and, and that's really, and you alluded to this earlier, that the AFL was this basically a high-flying league. The passing game is what put the fans in the seats to help establish the AFL. It was sort of ahead of its time at that point in history. And, you know, Lou was a run-first coach. Um, Why or what was it that, that Lou saw, that the Bills saw, that told them, you know, we have to put together a defense such as the defense they did. Why did they basically approach the game from that defensive standpoint instead of concentrating more on an offensive, high-flying game like the Chargers and the Raiders from from back then? Why Why go and concentrate on defense like they did? Well, I think it was it was Saban's uh, upbringing. Um, you know, I mean, he played for Paul Brown. Um, you know, if you go back in, you know, he played with the Browns back in the 50s. So he was, you know, he learned from Paul Brown. Well, Paul Brown was a defensive coach. He had, you know, I mean, look at the run, the great running backs that uh, Paul Brown produced. Mm-hmm. Oh, um, sure. and so so I think he really learned that defense wins championships. Um, no matter how good your offense is, if you can put the Sestacks and the McDowell's of the world on the field and you can pressure the offense into making mistakes um, and you can control the football, you have a, you have a good chance to win a championship. And that's, that's how he built his team. I mean, and, and, you know, he tried to do the same thing, you know, with the bills 10 years later and didn't have the same success, but, um, but that was his, uh, you know, his, his MO. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously it, you know, it won him two championships and almost got him into the first Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. So Sestak, you know, how, you know, obviously he is a key cog in this Buffalo defense. 
And again, as you said, 1963, he was the AFL's outstanding lineman. He was gaining a reputation at this point so early in his career, really, as perhaps the best defensive tackle in all of football, the AFL and the NFL. He was voted first team AFL by every voting association there was. He averaged ridiculous numbers of unassisted tackles per game, seven, eight, nine unassisted tackles per game. He helped Buffalo to the Eastern Division Championship in 1963. I mean, how big a miss was this for the NFL to not get Tom Sestak? How big a miss was this that he he was drafted 17th the 17th round in the NFL draft and the 16th round in the AFL draft i can't how how, do, how does a guy like this go so unnoticed and he's playing college as a tight end i, I it's 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 this guy was phenomenal yeah no, he was. I mean, it's, it's, you know, I mean, it's kind of a rags to riches story when you, when you think about it and, you know, fortuitous that he played for Saban. Cause like you said, if he had gone to Detroit, you know, he might've washed out in training camp and been mm-hmm. cut and never played again. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so Saban saw something in him that, you know, other coaches did not see. Um, and, you know, luckily he, he kind of came along, um, you know, w- when he did and, you know, are, are you could argue that, you know, Sestak was one of the greatest players in the AFL that the NFL missed on, you know, Bill, Billy Shaw is another one. The only, mm-hmm. you know, the only hall of fame player that played exclusively in the American football league. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, those, so those are two of the, <laughs> two of the players. And one of the things Billy Shaw said, because he played against Sestak in practice every day. And he basically, you know, gave Tom a lot of credit for him ultimately making the hall of fame. Cause he said, you know, when you play against Sestak every day, he said, you either get better or you retire. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, so, yeah, so the Bills go and they, they make it to the Eastern Division Championship in 63. And as we've talked at length already, 1964, you know, that was the first of a few very special seasons for Sestak and the Bills. Can you tell us a little bit more about the 64 season and how this team really finally came together? Um, you know, they did win the championship, beating San Diego 20 to 7. Um, the defense was crazy dominating. It gave up just a league low of 242 points. They gave up just 65 yards rushing per game. And they only gave up four rushing touchdowns the entire season. Tell us a little bit about that 1964 season and just how special it really was and just, you know, how the Bills finally, they gelled and came together. Yeah, well, they really did. I mean, it was, you know, um, I mean, for the first time, the offense really kind of came together between Kemp playing well Um, and cookie Gilchrist. Um, and of course the defense, as we've talked about was, was dominant, but it was really the first time the offense, um, you know, really kind of came together and was playing well and the bills dominated. I mean, they were nine and oh, the first nine games of the season, you know, they, they, they were beating teams, you know, 34 to 17, 30 to three, 48 to 17. Um, and then they lost to the Boston Patriots, um, in week 10. And that's the famous game where Gilchrist basically walked out on the team because he didn't think he was getting the ball enough. And so he walked off the field during the game in a dispute. Um, And Saban wanted to basically cut him. Um, And Jack Kemp went to his defense and basically said, hey, Lou, (laughs) we got a chance to win a championship and we need Cookie to do it. Um, and, you know, ultimately, you know, the short story is Gilchrist ended up apologizing to the team and they let him back on the, on the team. And, you know, obviously he was a very important player, but I also think that that brought the team together. 
And then one of the famous, uh, you know, famous things that happened with that team is then they come to Boston, the last game of the season at Fenway Park, and they're playing for the division championship to qualify for the championship game to play San Diego. Mm -hmm. And they're playing in the snow at Fenway Park. Um, And the Bills came into the game 11 and 2, and the Patriots were 10, 2, and 1. So whoever won the game was was the Eastern Division champion and would play San Diego the next week. On the first play from scrimmage, Gilchrist gets the ball. Kemp hands him the ball. He runs about eight yards and runs into Chuck Shanta, who was a safety for the Patriots. Knocks them out. (laughs) Gets up and stands over him. And he looks at the rest of the Patriots and he goes, which one of you XYZs is next? (laughs) And goes back to the huddle. (laughs) Set the tone of the game. And the Bills, you know, the Bills ended up uh, beating them uh, 24 to 14. Wow. Um, And that was actually arguably a tougher game than the than the Chargers game. Well, yeah, it sure sure sounds like it in the snow with and 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 against a team from their own conference that probably plays a similar style and, you know, on the road, on the road in Boston. Sure. I mean, absolutely. And then they go on to beat the Chargers, as we've said before. 20 to 7. I have a question. I don't know if you could answer this because uh, I don't know how it worked back then between the AFL and the NFL, whether or not teams were allowed to try and raid players and, and go back and forth. But did the NFL ever, did any team from the NFL ever try to entice Sestak to leave Buffalo and join the NFL? Um, well, in the in the short term, the answer would be no. So, in other words, the 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 two leagues had an unwritten rule that they would not sign players from their from the other league once they were in the other league. They would fight over the rookies, mm-hmm. but once Namath signed with the Jets or Sestak signed with the Bills, the other league wasn't going to come after them, and that that stayed that way. Until 1960, after the 1965 season. And actually what ultimately created the merger is the New York Giants signed Pete Gogolak from the Mm. Bills. He was the first player that was on an AFL or NFL team that was signed by the other, by the other league. And that Mm. really escalated the war between the two leagues. And after he was signed, the AFL owners met and Al Davis said, I'm going to get you a merger. And he went out and the AFL team signed several NFL players um, in a very short period of time. And I mean, name players like John Brody and Mike Ditka and players that were big names in the NFL. And the NFL basically came to them and said, we, we, we got to stop this. Mm. And that ultimately led to the merger in 1966. Oh, interesting. Yeah. It was all Pete Pete Gogolak of all people, Pete Gogolak. Yeah. Um, and so no, so Sestak, they, they didn't come after him because that was actually a very short window from the time they signed Gogolak to the time that was the merger was less than six months. Mm. Uh, It happened. It happened quickly because I think, you know, hey, these were a lot of very astute businessmen, and they knew that they, if they were going to escalate salaries, they were going to they were going to kill themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, it was Ralph Wilson who was the Bills owner who actually started the merger conversations with with the NFL. Mm-hmm. And then it was Lamar Hunt that actually, you know, sure. got the deal done. But right. Wilson had the first conversation. Well, let's get back to Tom for a second here. In your article, you wrote a a really nice bio about Tom for the Professional Football Researchers Association. Great, great organization. I encourage everyone to go check out uh, uh, their website. There's a lot of information there. Join it if you're a football fan. It's really good. Um, You mentioned in your article about Tom these numbers. Over a seven-game stretch, 
he blocked three field goals, knocked down at least one pass in each of those seven games. He was just just that good. I mean, how did this guy dominate? Was he a dominating force? Did teams have to plan around him? At this point in his career, it's 1964, it's just his third year in pro football, and Lou Saban is saying this guy's already the best defensive tackle in all of football. Paint us a picture of just how good Tom was. Well, I, yeah, to a great extent, um, you know, and you, and you get it with the statistics. He was almost unblockable because he was so quick to go with his strength for a defensive lineman that he could get past the offensive lineman um, and beat his man to the ball so quickly. Um, and he was a penetrating defensive lineman, so he didn't just stand at the point of attack and wait for the game to come to him. He went to the game. He went to the action, which is very different than a lot of defensive tackles play, especially in today's game, Mm -hmm. where there's a lot of, you know, you chuck the guy at the line of scrimmage and you kind of hold your position and then you look for the linebackers to come in and make the plays. He was the one who was making making the plays and and dominating, you know, the the line of scrimmage. And hey, you know, did, did it help? That he had, as as you mentioned earlier, you know, Ron McDowell and Jim Dunaway and Tom Day, so that there couldn't be a lot of double and triple teaming of Sestak because the other guys didn't. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, you know, especially McDowell, he was very good in his own right. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if you if you think of a, a center or a guard trying to block somebody like Sestak with the strength, his instincts, um, you know, and his quickness. It was a mismatch, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, week after week, which is, you know, obviously what what the statistics tell you. Is is there a guy in the game today that we can watch who you might say, you know, that guy is somewhat like Tom Sestak? Ah, man, geez, I don't know. I, I guess I'd have to. There's nobody that jumps out at me that I could point to and say, you know, he looks like. He looks like that because I think the game is quite a bit different, Mm -hmm. you know, today um, than that. Um, Yeah, nobody's nobody's really jumping to mind. He was that good. Why does he not get more notoriety? You know, why is he not better remembered? Well, the issue that you have is he had a he ended up because of injuries. Yeah. Had a short career. So, I mean, he was. He was terrific in, you know, 63, 64, 65. He got a knee injury um, and that he had his first knee surgery was between 64 and 65. Um, But he still was great in 65. Um, Saban kind of said, you know, late 65 and 66, he was playing on one leg. Um, and, And then he was, you know, he was out of the league after 68. Um, so, you know, he had a seven year career, which I still say he should be in the hall of fame. I mean, Terrell Davis is in the hall of fame. Yeah, he yeah, played he, six years. Yeah. He played five or six years and that's it. Yeah. Um, and I mean, Sestak dominated as much as Terrell Davis dominated, you know, on offense, mm-hmm. if not more so, um, you know, but, but the, the, I think where he gets hurt is the AFL, which I think is incorrect, doesn't doesn't get the same credit, especially in those years, as the NFL. That the NFL mm-hmm. was a was a better was a better league, um, and so you know I think Sestak gets discounted because of that. And it's really too bad that you know we didn't have championship games in '64 and '65 because uh, you know certainly the '64 Bills team. Um, I, I think they would have won the pro football championship. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they were the best team in pro football that year, but you know, somebody could either, either easily argue against that. Mm-hmm. Um, but mm-hmm. I think, you know, the, a- and of course the AFL wasn't known for defense either. Right. Right. Um, Only this team was. Yeah. Um, and I mean, you know, and, and I just think that there's a bias against the AFL. Cause I mean, when you think about it, that, you know, Billy Shaw is the only player that played only in the AFL to make the Hall of Fame. 
you know, J- Johnny Robinson, who was a spectacular safety, just got into the Hall of Fame. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's very few players that made their name in the AFL that are in the Hall of Fame. There's mm-hmm. several that played in the AFL and then they made their name in the NFL. Mm-hmm. But there's not a lot of AFL players, mm-hmm. um, you know, that are in the Hall of Fame. And that's that, that's that's actually a tragedy. I mean, that's that, that belongs in my in my view, because he dominated so much, he, even though it was for you know a relatively short period, he was dominant. Mm-hmm. He had another. There was another lineman on the team, and you and you've mentioned his name a couple of times. And I did a podcast with him, Ron McDole, and you know, sure, he also played in the NFL after his AFL days were over, and he had a good career in the NFL as well. And a lot of people think that he should be in the Hall of Fame. You know, he said that Tom was as tough as they came. He talked about how Tom was able to play at a at this incredibly high level after the injuries that you discussed. He couldn't even practice. He couldn't practice the last two years of his career, and yet he performed at this crazy, ridiculous high level. Like, he never missed a beat. How tough was he? And then, of course, talk about those last couple of years about how he couldn't practice, but still managed to suit up and contribute mightily those last. Yeah, two no, years. I mean, I, I mean, I, I think that you know Eddie Abramowski, who was the Bills' trainer, you know, probably you know said it, said it best. He said he was so tough that you couldn't believe it. He said sometimes he hurt so bad he couldn't even lift weights. He couldn't even sleep. The pain was so bad. Hmm. And yet he would come out on Sunday and he would play and you, you would be amazed at how well he played. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And he just, as Abramowski said, he just keeps playing. Um, and so, I mean, the toughness that he had, as McDowell said, and everybody that played with him said was, you know, just an incredible amount of toughness and, you know, kind of meant, you know, mind over matter. Um, I'm going to play, I'm going to play well, and I'll, I'll worry about my injuries later. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, I mean, I think, I think maybe the tribute that's most significant is, you know, everybody knows Lenny Dawson, you know, a great hall of fame quarterback. Mm -hmm. And he said that Sestak was the greatest defensive player he ever played against. Pretty high compliment. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't get Um, much higher than that. No. And I mean, you know, here's a guy who, you know, led Kansas city to a couple of super bowls and they yep. won one. And, yep. um, you know, he was, he was, you know, a terrific quarterback in his own right, but sure. he, he had a lot. And of course they played him, you know, a couple times a year and in championship games. And, um, so, you know, he, he got to see Sestak up close for sure. What about the camaraderie, especially on the bills? Tom struck up this great friendship, Tom struck up this great friendship with Paul McGuire, who most people probably know if they remember him at all as, uh, you know, a terrific analyst on NBC during football season. Tell us about the camaraderie with his teammates and his friendship with Paul. Yeah, I mean, and I think, too, you know, it, it also goes to playing in a smaller city like Buffalo. Um, a lot of the players. um lived close to each other. They knew each other. Um, you know, they not only played together, but they went out together. They spent a lot of time with their families. Like, and you may have got this from Ron McDowell. McDowell every year had a big Halloween party that all the players (laughs) dressed up. I sure did. Um, and so they just had this, this friendship, um, and they were part of the community. Um, and so, you know, Tom was, you know, all a part of that. And, you know, McGuire was known as a real jokester and a, and a fun guy to be around. Um, and, you know, Tom and him struck up a really good relationship. They ultimately opened a restaurant together called Sestak and McGuire's, which was a very popular restaurant in Buffalo for several years. Um, and, you know, that was just part of the, I, and I think that's part of what made the team a championship team. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, they got along together. They did a lot together. Um, and you know, when you're, when you, when you, when you're friends with somebody and then you're fighting in the trenches and you disagree, it's a lot easier to, to, 
you know, play together and resolve your differences when you mm-hmm. have a relationship. One of the other things that you wrote about, and I've seen this in other places as well, you know, the AFL, it, it, it was just different. The players would get together with their opponent the night before a game, and they'd have a great time. Sure, when they got out on the field, it was all business. But away from the field, I don't know, I just get this feeling that it was this different, uh, you know, it, it was just different. The players, they got along, even with their opponents away from the field. They'd go out for drinks the night before the game. I don't know if they were searching for information, but how different was the game back then and how different was the attitude of the AFL? Well, I think to some extent, I think that comes with the league being a startup, right? Like even if you think about Mm -hmm. even today, when you think of startup companies, um, and and I worked for a couple, you, you have this, a kind of camaraderie because it's like you against the world. It's like you're trying to achieve this special thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, and it brings you together and it even brings you together. Like you said, with your, with your opponent, because at the end of the day, they wanted to see the AFL to be successful. And I mean, if you think of it as a, as a fan, you know, I was a big AFL fan. Hey, I was rooting for the jets to win the super bowl, even though the jets were a big, you know, they, they, they were one of our rivals mm-hmm. in the AFL. But boy, did I want the Jets to win the Super Bowl to prove the AFL yeah, was sure, as good as right, the NFL. Right. You, you bet. And, you know, the same with the Chiefs. I mean, I'm rooting for the Chiefs in Super Bowl one, even though the week before they trounced my team. Um, but you 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 know, the, the AFL was was bigger. You wanted the AFL to be successful and to have that credibility that, you know, they were fighting for. And, and I think that brought a camaraderie among both the players on their own teams, but also with their, with their opponents. I mean, every player in the AFL was thrilled when the, when the jets and the chiefs won the back-to-back Super Bowls because they thought they were legitimized. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like you said, he was really respected by his teammates, by those who played against him. Three things come to mind when I think about Tom Sestak, how overlooked he is, as one of the game's greats, how tough he was, and how young he was when he passed away. What do you think about when you look back on the career of Tom Sestak? Yeah, I mean, I I think Tom Sestak was one of the greatest defensive line players I've I've ever seen in the in the game. Um, I think he transcended football. Um, He was an incredible player, an incredible teammate. Um, He made the Bills a championship team. Um, I think that's the other thing that I'm sure hurts his, you know, credibility or hurts his ability to get in the Hall of Fame and that he did die so young. I mean, he died in 1987. He was only 51 years old. So he didn't have a chance to, you know, get appreciated or people talk to him and remember him because he wasn't around. He was, he was gone. And even though the bills put him on, you know, he was the third bill on their wall of fame, um, which, you know, he so rightfully, rightfully deserves. But I just think so many sports writers today have no idea who Tom Sestak was. Not a clue. And that's part of the reason why I do podcasts like this to, to remind people of the other greats of the game, whom for whatever reason, we just don't remember. And when you think about the Buffalo Bills and you think about the – they do. They have a great history even though, you know, they've had some uh, long periods of down years. But they've had some great, great players over the course of their history. Cookie Gilchrist, Jack Kemp, O.J. Simpson, you know, Jim Kelly and those teams – Nobody talks about Tom Sestak. Well, and, and, and Warren, you know, to come back to maybe the question you asked a while ago, even though they played different positions, their impact on the game was probably similar. Sestak would be comparable to the impact Bruce Smith has had. Mm. You know, Bruce Smith is considered one of the top two or three defensive ends to ever play the game. Mm-hmm. Now, he played a different position than Sestak, but imagine Sestak had that kind of impact from a defensive tackle position. He was that impactful. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. 
And, you know, it's just, you know, Bruce Smith played, you know, 18 years and Sestak played seven. Yeah. Um, but he had that kind of impact on a game. Mm-hmm. What surprised you most when you did your research about him? What did you learn about Tom Sestak or what did you discover? And you said, wow, that's 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 pretty cool. Well, I mean, I think, you know, and I'm I'm kind of a statistics nerd. So, I mean, I think the things that I was most amazed by was the amount of individual solo tackles that a defensive tackle like that made, um, I think was significant. Certainly the 17 game consecutive streak of, of not allowing, um, you know, a touchdown and then just his, his toughness and everybody, you know, that was like the first words out of their mouths when they talked about Sestak was how tough he was, but also how, what a nice guy he was. Mm. Like he was just a really, personable, friendly, nice guy. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And that's not always the case. Right. Well, Greg, when we look back on the career of Tom Sestak, how should we all remember him? Well, yeah, I think you want to remember him as certainly one of the greatest defensive players that played in the American Football League. Um, And he was really a transformative defensive player at a time when you know, that certainly the AFL was not a defensive league and he made them a defensive league and made them the Bills a championship team. Greg, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to spend with me on Sports Forgotten Heroes. You know, I I love doing these podcasts and talking about guys like Tom Sestak who are truly great, great athletes, great players whom, for whatever reason, Tom is a guy that's forgotten. Guys like that are just forgotten. And um, I'm glad that, you know, we were able to get together and talk about him. Yeah, Warren, hey, I really appreciate it. I well, appreciate the opportunity for me personally to be on your show, but uh, certainly to talk about one of my uh, one of my favorite players of all time. And uh, I, I hope someday he'll, he'll get the recognition in the Hall of Fame that he, he really deserves. Absolutely. Greg, thanks again so much. All right. Take care. Thanks. You know, Sports Forgotten Heroes is about the stars whom time has forgotten. When I came up with the idea for this podcast, I didn't realize just how good or great some of the stars were that I would eventually talk about. Sometimes, after I finish an interview, I'm left wondering, how is this guy or that guy not better remembered? Why are we not talking about him more? Why isn't he in the Hall of Fame? Well, I think Tom Sestak is one of those guys. He had an incredible career. Short? Yes. But, like today's guest Greg Tranter said, Terrell Davis also had a short career. And I'm not taking anything away from Terrell. His seven years in Denver, that included two Super Bowl wins and that incredible 1998 season when he rushed for over 2,000 yards and 21 touchdowns, well, it was just remarkable. But it's so much easier to validate the career of an offensive player who is measured by his numbers much more than a defensive player who is just not as, well, sexy. The fact is, Tom Sestak was regarded as the best in the game by so many. Am I advocating for his induction into the Pro Football Hall of Fame? Not necessarily. But what I am saying is this, he was one of the best. And to not be remembered or spoken about in the fashion he should be, is a big oversight. Thanks again to my guest today, Greg Tranter, and thanks to all of you for tuning in. I'll see you next time on Sports Forgotten Heroes. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. 
and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.